I don't know why nobody else whistles during that day. It's just like you should, it feels like you should be whistling. I had some friends that told me that after last week, they went home and they rented the breakfast club. And they said they kept waiting for the part that was really inspiring. And they said they watched the whole movie and at the end they went, huh, it was just for the whistling part. And so they're welcome. There's nothing inspiring about the breakfast club other than it's awesome. And so open to the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. If you don't have a Bible and you'd like to use one, just raise your hand and we'll bring you one that you can either borrow or you can keep. It's our gift to you, you can also open the U version or the Bible app on your smart device. And if you have your location services enabled, we're going to pop up. Otherwise, there's a button in the bottom right hand corner that you can click on, and a search bar will come up. Put Life Church Green Bay in there. All the notes and scriptures, everything that you're going to see behind me, other than pictures, have already been uploaded. If you're watching us live on our online campus, or you're at one of our services at the Brown County Correctional Facility. Love you guys. Give these guys a hand, would you? Couldn't be here today. So my friend Keith, who plays the bass, he came back and he said, man, they are loud today. So you guys must have really been into the music today. So kudos to you. So give yourselves a hand today. So I want to take a couple of minutes today and talk about something that's kind of uh, become near and dear to my heart. I did this series because I feel like we live in a naturally negative society. In such a dog-eat-dog, -dog, ladder-climbing, social-building, one-upping culture of posts and comments, friends and followers, pins and snaps and double taps, likes and loves and shares, retweets and repost that in all of that, the whole human experience seems to have lost the human in its experience. And so we insulate our insecurities with bogus bios where our otherwise unknown personalities are inflated with hopes that otherwise unknown people will be infatuated with what we hope they do see rather than being disappointed with what we hope they don't see. And so in all of our attempts to climb and claw, scratch and surge, to form ourselves into our own image, we fail to realize that there is an image that we were already designed to be formed into. Like somehow it's been forgotten that in spite of all of our different characteristics, every one of us was designed with the same core. That at the center of who all of us are, we were all wired to be loving and kind, patient, and compassionate with all of our hearts, with of all our souls, with all of our minds, but most importantly, I think, with all of our mouths. It's that little piece, the mouthpiece that I wanna talk about today in a message that we're calling, I'm encouraging. Let's pray. God, we love you. Thank you for being the great encourager. Thank you for constantly speaking life over us and never speaking death. I pray today that you would dismantle the entire image that we've tried to build of ourselves. That God, you will systematically take away every part that doesn't belong. That God, you would reinstall, reinsert, reassemble us into the image that you designed us to be like. I pray today that we would leave this place more and more like you. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'm, I'm like probably most of you and I love technology. Like I have all of the stuff. I don't know how to use most of it, but I have and love all of the stuff. I'm sure that my iPhone is capable of far more than it is doing, but I, I love it. And when the new one comes out, I wait until they like go on sale and then I go, yay, I got the new phone. I, actually, the newest phone that I have has a mind of its own. I'm not sure. It, it uh, has an agenda. And what it does is every time I put my phone in my pocket, it either uh, text messages somebody, it uh, messages somebody like a Facebook messenger, or it calls people. It like randomly calls people. And it will call people like off of Facebook who I didn't even know that I had their phone number. I didn't even know that you could call people from one phone to their Facebook. The other day, I pulled my phone out of my pocket and I had sent a message to somebody on Facebook where I request $8,818 from them. I don't even know how that number went in there. I didn't even know you could ask for money on Facebook. So I left it for a little bit. Because I thought maybe he'll send it. Maybe he'll go, oh, well, of 
course, this is, maybe it was God. Maybe God texted him and said that he was supposed to give me $8,818 until he texted me back and he requested that I give him $9,000. I said, <laughs> I said, LOL, that was a pocket text. And he said, LOL, mine wasn't, dot, dot, dot. <laughs> I thought, oh. So like, I don't know how to use most of it, but I have all this stuff. And so like my iPhone, my iPad, my MacBook, and my Apple TV have all made it so my life is not just compatible and convenient, but it is seamlessly connected. It ensures that there's never any drop off, even when I'm forced to switch devices. Like I can begin a document on my laptop and if I save it in the right way, I can go home and I can open up my desktop and I can start right where I left off on another device. And then I can save it in the right way. And then if I have my tablet, then I can open that device on my tablet and I can continue on. It's made things very, very seamless. In fact, thanks to my Hue app, my Nest thermostat and my Ring digital doorbell, I can turn my lights on, my temperature down and allow access to my front door to anyone, no matter where I am in the world with just the simple touch of a button. All of which is why I simultaneously love the convenience and hate the callousness that technology has created. For all of the connection that it enables, there is a disproportionate amount of disconnection that exists inside of it. Technology has somehow managed to dehumanize human interaction. Thanks to texting and emailing, messaging and posting, in a matter of minutes, I am able to tear down what someone else has spent their entire lives building up. I can slander their character or soil their reputation with just the simple touch of a button. And the longer I watch it, the more I become amazed at what people are willing and able to say or about just about anybody. Like there seems to be no fear. There seems to be uh, no more accountability anymore. I think that the screen of your device has somehow become the thing that replaces the driver's side window of your car. Anybody who uh, has like a wrestling with anger, anybody who grew up in a certain kind of neighborhood, you understand the, your natural proclivity to have road rage. When people cut me off, I got to pray about it. Jesus, please. I got to pray in the spirit. I got to go all Acts 2, 4 and pray in the Holy Ghost about it. I got to speak in tongues over that person so that I don't use the wrong language. I got to use God's language instead of driving language. Y'all know there's a driving language. It's sign language. All of it. Not that y'all have ever used it, but there's been times somebody's cut me off and I forgot I was saved for a minute. You know what I'm saying? So in Jesus' name. I wasn't waving at you if you cut me off. Just know that it wasn't this. My hand was backwards and it was just, oh, yay, you're... I wasn't giving you a thumbs up. I was giving you something. You, but they see, like people, they think that their driver's side window insulates them or isolates them, that, that people will say things or do things from behind a window of a car that they wouldn't do at the grocery store. They'll, you cut them off or they'll cut you off. You, you, give a, you know there's honk language, right? Y'all know that there's words. Your horn has certain words. Like a quick one is like, hey, all right now. <laughs> you, somebody lets you in, boop, boop. that means, all right, man. But if somebody cuts you off, then ah, 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 you know, you know what that means. That's Morris code for I love you. <laughs> if somebody cuts you off at the grocery store, they would never flip you off. But something happens when people are in their car. They feel like there is no fear or no accountability. And the same thing happens behind screens because the absence of accountability and fear has largely been facilitated by a false sense of security that happens when we hide behind this. And all of this, this whole idea has become so near and dear to me because I am trying with everything within me to raise two teenagers in 2018. Now, I think that being a teenager has always been hard. Like school wasn't hard for me. I loved school. High school to me was my jam. It was like, when I look back on it, I have great memories. But that's probably what happens when you don't go to class. Like when I went to lunch and football practice. So basically I ate and played football. That was my whole high school. And friends, hanging out with my friends, cutting up, making fun of people. That was high school in a nutshell to me. So I look back and I go, oh, this is great. So when my kids come home and they go, oh man, school is terrible. Oh, I don't want to go to school. Can I just homeschool? Can I transfer? Can I switch schools? And I go, 
Uh, I don't know. Like, but I think, like, if you look back, you'd go, being a teenager has, it's always been hard. You don't make the team, so you don't feel good enough. You didn't get into that AP class, so you didn't feel smart enough. You don't get invited to the party, so you don't feel cool enough. You asked that hottie to the dance, she said no, and so you don't feel attractive enough. And then because you're not good enough, you're not in the jock crowd. Because you're not smart enough, you're not in the nerd crowd. Because you're not cool enough or attractive enough, you're not in the in crowd. And teenagers spend a lot of time not just being alone, but feeling alone. Like so many of them feel like they're on the outside looking in and all of that was before social media. Doesn't it feel like social media exploded out of nowhere? Doesn't it feel like we've always had it? And yet you can look back like five years ago and you go, I don't even even know what that was. And like it's like exploded and somehow social media has has become the thing that determines your social status. And like, I would hate to be a 14 year old growing up in this day with social media. First of all, because it seems like everybody is watching everything you do. It feels like everybody is grading every post that you put up. Like your picture didn't get as many likes as your friend's picture, or it seems like everybody has more followers or more subscribers than you do. I mean, like back when I was a kid, you might've had to live with the feeling that you weren't as popular as everybody else, but today, There's like hard data proving the level of or the lack of your popularity. And all of that can be very, very discouraging. The second reason I'd hate being a kid growing up with social media is because of the stuff that other kids feel like they can freely post about you. And y'all, some of that stuff is just mean. Like it's downright hateful. It's straight from the pit of hell. The amount of abuse that our kids are forced to absorb The number of discouraging words that they are forced to digest on any given day is completely and totally unfair. And I know that because I've watched this happen in my daughter's life. I have a daughter, Aubrey, she's she's 13. And I can say with like zero tinge of bias that from my observation, she is the best friend to whoever she's friends with. She's loving and kind. She's patient and compassionate in the way that she acts, in the words that she uses. But the way that some of the kids in her life treat her and talk to her makes me want to go to that girl's house and lay hands on her father in a Christian way. You know what I'm talking about? Not in, in, in Jesus name. Because for these kids, there seems to be no fear. There seems to be no accountability whatsoever. And let me just take a commercial break to be ghetto for just two seconds, okay? If you don't know if... I need to reword this for two... Carry the one. If you have kids and they have social media and you don't know their login and their password, you better by the end of today. And if you're a kid, whatever. (laughs) If your kid has an Instagram, or or they got a spam account on Instagram, or they got a fake account on Instagram, or they got a bootleg account on Instagram, or if they got Twitter, or or if if they've got us, If they got Snapchat, they shouldn't, number one. Let me just say that. Listen, I'm getting all off the rails, but I don't trust... (laughs) I don't trust anything that you can post and it disappears right now. I'm 45, I don't have a Snapchat. Do you know why? Because I feel like there should be some level of accountability in Jesus' name. Sonny has every one of my passwords and every one of my usernames. And so here, from one... Let me just talk to the dudes because next week you're going to get a food truck and I don't want to yell at you next week. (laughs) From one guy, from one father to another, could we please install some accountability so that our kids will stop killing each other physically and emotionally? The stuff, the stuff that they will say about each other and you don't follow your own kid on social media or they don't let you, they got you blocked. So you don't see the stuff that they'll put up and they're breaking each other's hearts. And and it's breaking my heart because unfortunately, far too many people don't have it stopped when they go out of their teen years. 
The discouragement that exists in our lives, it doesn't just start on a screen. It takes place in our neighborhoods and in our workplaces. Like, like everybody got into the college that they wanted except for you. You got passed over for a promotion yet again. Your high school friend makes double the money that you make and you know that because they take every opportunity to point it out. Your best girlfriend took her baby weight off in six weeks and you're still hiding yours with Spanx after six years. Your brother, he built a big, beautiful dream home and he wants to rub it in every opportunity that he gets and he invites you over. You're not, your neighbor just somehow bought a fancy foreign car and they want you to see them waxing it every time you come out. Your in-laws constantly tell you how they don't agree with how you're raising your kids. And it feels like the people in your circle are constantly condescending. And the reason for that is because the devil is determined to drown you in discouragement. You know, by definition, the word discourage means to rob someone of their courage. Do you ever feel like you've been robbed of your courage? And so because of that, whenever we talk about there being more for your life, whenever it is we push for you to dream, it makes you wanna like curl up in a ball and hide. So like when the devil tries to drive you into the dirt with discouragement, you need to understand that this book says that God is the eternal endless source of encouragement. And so whereas the word discourage means to rob someone of their courage, the word encourage means to add courage to their lives. I don't want to rob people of their courage. I want to add courage to their life. And this book says that God is the great encourager, the great adder, which isn't a word, but it's a good idea, the great adder of courage. And I love what St. Paul said. He said, when we arrived in Macedonia, there was no rest for us. We faced conflict from every direction. I love this, with battles on the outside and fear on the inside. Do you ever feel like you have a battle on the outside and fear on the inside? And then he says these beautiful two words, but God. Anytime there's a negative in scripture and then there's those two words, you know, something's fixing to flip. And so he said, this has been, we got fear on the inside, but God who encourages those who are discouraged, encouraged us by the arrival of Titus. So like, but God, the one who encourages those who are discouraged. So if you want to be like God, you have to, it's not optional. You have to be an encourager someone who adds courage to others. And then we hear that from the guy on the stage and we say, okay, yeah, great, great idea. But how, which is, I'm glad that you asked because I have five things I wanna talk about. And if you hadn't asked, this would just be awkward. So I wanna give you five steps to becoming an encourager. And here's the first. Number one is inspect. Inspect yourself every single day. A few years ago, the American Cancer Society had like this great campaign slogan and it said, early detection saves lives. And I wonder if it works for cancer, couldn't it also work for our spirit? So like inspect yourself as often as you can. Scripture says, put yourselves to the test. See if you're in the faith, examine yourselves. And so as often as you can, put yourself to the test, examine yourself, inspect yourself, your heart, your soul, your mind, your mouth. What are you carrying in your heart that might be discouraging you? What are you keeping in a little cell in your soul that might be robbing you of your courage? What have you allowed to capture your mind that's holding your courage hostage? What's coming out of your mouth? You know, listen, the words that come out of your mouth, they have to at some point become filtered. You know that you tend to sound like whoever it is you spend the most time with. And I wonder, are you spending more time with the enemy? And you may not think you are. Like nobody thinks they're hanging with the devil, right? That is, oh yeah, you're me and the D, yo, we're just kicking it. But listen, when you listen to certain things, you know, Jesus, it, he wouldn't choose, he didn't put that on your playlist. You know what I'm talking about? Those certain movies that you watch, the horror movies, the horror movies. You, did, Jesus didn't wake up and say, hey, Hey man, let's watch some, uh, let's watch some Blair Witch today. That'd be dope. He just didn't say, hey, let's do th That's another voice. You're spending time with an, I read an article this week about this new horror movie that's coming out. And you notice I say that slow. There, that, there's this new horror movie that's coming out. And, and I read an interview with the guy who wrote it. It's, it has been dubbed as the, as the scariest movie that has ever been produced. Y'all, I've seen some scary movies. This must be scary. 
Like I seen poltergeists and that's uh, like Rosemary's Baby. That stuff was messed up. Like I wanted to not even have kids after that. I, I watched, listen, I watched Amityville Horror. I was so afraid I wanted to be homeless. You know what I'm talking about? That movie is, dude, get out. All right, fine. I don't even need to be, I don't even need to have a house. It's just so scary. How scary could this movie be? That the guy who wrote it said, when I wrote this movie, my goal was to, to disturb people at the deepest spiritual level. I was like, well, at least we're not lying about it anymore. Like, you will sound like whoever you spend the most time with. And so, ladies, if you are watching Fifty Shades of Anything, it is no secret why you're talking trash about your husband. Men, if you are looking at naked women other than your spouse, it is no wonder why you are talking to your friends in ways that you shouldn't because you are spending time with the wrong person in the wrong spirit. When you spend time with Jesus, the great encourager, scripture says you're going to have life-giving water flow from deep inside of you. And so the first step to being an encourager is you have got to inspect yourself every single day. Here's the second step to being an encourager is you got to reflect. Once you've completed the inspection, you got to do some reflection, not just on what you've discovered, but also on what you desire. How is it that you want to feel? Who is it that you want to be? How is it that you want to think? What do you want to say? Like, friends, the best way to get what you desire is to actually focus on what you already have. What's already going on in your life that's worthy of attention? Your spouse, your kids, your parents, the job you have, the health you have, the house, the car, you already have. Focus on those things. Think on those things. Encourage yourself in those things. You may not have a Ferrari, but guess what? Half of you wouldn't even fit in it. So you just go, oh, well, great, I don't have a Ferrari. No problem. Think of the speeding tickets that you're not getting because you drive a Focus rather than a Ferrari. And at first Samuel, David, the king, he's having this really, really difficult time. And he was having battles on the outside and fear on the inside. I mean, his own people were rallying against him. You ever feel like your own people are rallying against you? His own people were plotting and planning on killing him. Do you feel like everybody around you is trying to kill you, at least in your spirit? Here's what scripture says about David the king. David encouraged himself in the Lord. The whole community was missing it. The whole community wanted to kill him. But he knew if God is for us, nobody can be against us. And sometimes you've just got to encourage yourself. You got to back up and say, even though I'm experiencing challenges, I know because scripture says it, that I am loved. I am valuable. I'm important. Thank God that I'm healthy. Thank God I'm so fortunate. I have more things than I could possibly need. I mean, we live in a culture where people can't park in their garages. First of all, we live in a culture where people have garages and they park their vehicle, which most of the world doesn't have, in a building designed and built only for their car, which most of the world doesn't even have shelter right now. Our cars have shelter that we're not utilizing for shelter for our cars because we have boxes of things that, we're, that we are no longer using anymore. Stuff, just stuff, extra stuff. You got any stuff? Oh yeah, I got a lot of stuff, extra stuff. I was gonna do a garage sale, but mm, I'm tired of that. I'll just give it away. And we give away stuff. We're the only culture that gets rid of stuff that works to get stuff that works better. We're the only culture that gets rid of stuff that's valuable so we can get something that's more expensive. Like, why don't we stop for just a minute and say, you know what? I am so fortunate. I'm so blessed because things that you appreciate tend to get better and things that you depreciate tend to get worse. I love the reminder that we get from the book of Philippians. It says, finally, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, just, pure, lovely, whatsoever things are of good report. If there's any virtue, if there's any praise, think about those things. What do you have in your life today that fits into those little boxes and categories. Want to be an encourager? You have got to reflect. Here's a third step to being an encourager is reject. Reject any idea that suggests you're not good enough or smart enough, cool enough or attractive enough. And reject any idea that suggests other people aren't either. Anytime a discouraging thought comes into your mind about you or about anybody else, you need to reject it. Scripture says, when I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child, but when I became a man, I gave up my childish 
ways. Listen, it's one thing for somebody when they're six to say ugly things about somebody else, but when you're 36 or 46 or 66, you just sound like a kid. And at some point, we have got to develop enough maturity to recognize the thoughts that we have that are worth repeating and the thoughts that we have that are worth rejecting. You do not have to allow every thought that comes into your mind to come out of your mouth. We've got to be able to recognize which thoughts are from him and which thoughts are from hell. And when you look at somebody and you think something ugly, you have got to get to a place where you recognize that that thought is not from him. That thought is straight from hell. When you get around somebody and you start thinking discouraging thoughts and you start typing it on your phone and texting it, like none of you do this, but like when you see somebody whose jeans are out of style and you clip the picture and you want to text it to somebody else, you doubt that you've ever done that, but I have a friend who uh, has been used to like back in the day used to do that. And just as you wanna, like you wanna infect somebody else with your stuff, you have to realize, ask yourself one question. Make this like if you had homework. This week, when thoughts come into your mind, ask yourself one question, him or hell? Because God never wants us to say discouraging things to or about anyone because God never wants to rob us of our courage. He said, my thoughts are nothing like your thoughts. My ways are so far beyond anything that you could even imagine. And friends, the only way to close the gap between his ways and our ways is to take the fourth step to being an encourager, and that's connect. Connect with Jesus on a deeper level, a deeper level than you have ever connected with him, which requires commitment and consistency. Connecting with Jesus requires that we make the Jesus thing more than a Sunday thing. And we connect with him through prayer and scripture. In other words, we connect with Jesus by talking to him and by listening to him. Now, let me give you a very elementary description because the longer that you're with Jesus, the more that you progress. But at least in the beginning, prayer is how we talk to him and scripture is how he talks to us. If you're not hearing him speak, it's probably because you don't recognize his voice. Scripture is his voice. Connect with him. Make it hard for people to see where he ends and you begin. Become interconnected, become intertwined because he is the vine, we are the branches. If we stay joined to him, connected to him, he'll stay joined to us and connected to us. And then that's when we're gonna produce lots of fruit. But outside of him, you can do nothing. Without him, in your own strength, life is tough sledding. Positivity, encouragement is tough sledding because the devil's trying to drown you in discouragement. But with him, in his strength, you can do it. You are able to produce lots of fruit. You can become somebody that people say, oh yeah, he's really encouraging. He's, he's really positive. Oh, she's so kind. She's so benevolent. Like you can produce fruit in your life, but you have to do it by being connected to him. Finally, the last way to become an encourager is you have to project. You have got to speak life consciously. You have intentionally got to be life-giving. You have to be positive. Friends, open your mouth. Project it. Say it loud. Some of you have good thoughts that never become good words. Put some bass in your voice. Have some confidence and speak up. I know that some of you feel like you're gonna get rejected if you say kind things. Do you know how many people don't high five me at the door? (laughs) I still keep my hand up though, because somebody's gonna give one. And for everyone who doesn't give me one, somebody, yeah. And then sometimes I feel stupid because they're like, ah. Sometimes people look right at my hand too. Wish I would touch your hand. Think we're going to high five in the house of the Lord. Supposed to be in here shaking hands and giving Christian greeting. Like I just go, okay, well, you don't want to high five, whatever. I'm going to high five myself. <laughs> that's, all, that's all clapping is. You know that, right? You're just like, when you clap during worship, you're just high fiving yourself. Like, ooh, this song is dope. You, you get, see, you see what I'm saying? It's, it's like a, Here's what the proverb says. It's a joy to find the right word for the right occasion. 
Doesn't it feel good to say good things to people? If you don't know that, you need to try it. Like simple things, like, like, like uh, Sonny calls, sometimes she calls this Christian lying, but you know, in the Jewish faith, sometimes they, they say that sometimes this is acceptable. Like uh, you ever go up to somebody, just find, some, find something good to say. Ooh, I love those shoes. Girl, you lose weight. Oh, I love your hair like that. Hey, did you get your hair cut? Ooh, I love, look at your neck, look at that necklace. You don't even have to say it's nice, then you're not lying. Ooh, look at that necklace. Oh, look at them jeans. Go on, girl. Come on. <laughs> You're looking good. You know, I just find anything, something, anything. It doesn't, like, if you it's, it's, somebody may be, like, dying inside and walk past you and you go, hey, why are you looking good today? <laughs> okay. <laughs> My friend asked me today, why, are you limping or is that just your strut? I said, yes, both. Sometimes you just... <laughs> I had a girl come up to me last week and she said this to me, R.A. and pastor, by the way, your fit is on fleek. I said, I don't know what that means. Okay. <laughs> cause you know, I've been trying to wear smaller pants. Cause Sonny said, if you wear smaller pants, make you look thin. And so I, I, I bought some smaller pants and it was the first week I wore them. And I thought that she meant that the fit of my pants was right on. That's how old cat said that, right on player. <laughs> and it took my old mind a minute to catch up with her young slang, because I still got old slang. You know, it's, I had to process it and filter it through. And it, after about 30 seconds, I realized what she meant by fit was my outfit. And I said, okay. Now I don't know what fleek means, but I'm gonna assume it means that it's good. And so, so I did the best old guy response. I said, oh, you know, a little something I threw together. You know, just like. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, I pined over that outfit all week. It was the fifth shirt I had to go with those pants. But when she said it, I want to act like, oh, you know. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you, third service, I came out on stage like this. <laughs> My fit is fleek today. You know, I'm just like, okay, just, it just did something. It just, it, it just lifted me up a little bit. I felt like, whoa. And it's a joy to find the right word. You never know what they're going through. So scripture tells us to encourage each other, build each other up just as you're already doing. I love how the message says it, build up hope. So you'll all be together in this. No one left out, no one left behind. And he says, I know you're already doing that. Just keep on doing it. So can you imagine a city where we're all together in this, a city where nobody is left behind, where nobody is left out, where everybody feels positive, everybody feels encouraged. And so, you know what, when I think about this city, I think, yes, I can imagine that. And so I want to speak life over you today and tell you that you are so great, so wonderful. You're the best. You guys make me smile. When I think about you when you're not here, I think, oh, I can't wait until Sunday until my people get here. Like you make my heart bigger. My life is better with you than it is without you. And so because I love you, I believe in you. That's why I tell you that there's more for you. That's why I encourage you to dream because I believe in you and the potential. I'm grateful for you. I'm praying for you. I'm with you. I'm cheering you on because you are good enough. You're smart enough for anything. You're cool enough and you're definitely attractive enough. We know that because the book says that he created you in his own image. So in this dog eat dog ladder climbing status building one up in culture that wants to rob me of my courage and wants to use me to rob you of yours, I'm not having it. I've determined I'm not gonna speak death over you. I'm not gonna let people speak death over me and I'm not gonna speak it over you because as for me and my house, we're gonna serve the Lord. And if he's gonna encourage me, then I'm gonna encourage you. And I'm just gonna speak over myself and over you. I am encouraging. Would you close your eyes all across this place? So one of the most encouraging things is that we have hope, hope forever. And no matter what it is that you're going through today, Jesus has already made a way out of no way. And today he's giving opportunity for you to enter into a relationship with him. The most encouraging thing that you can do is receive him as your Lord and savior. And here's what that means. When you say that he's your Lord, that means that you're giving him control. You don't need to control your own life anymore. He'll do that for you. When you say that you want him to be your savior, that means that you need him to rescue you. And some of us, we just need to be rescued today. 
And so if that's you and you say, I need that, you don't have a relationship with Jesus, we're gonna give you opportunity to, to do that today before you go, and here's how. In just a moment, I'm gonna ask for people with every head bowed and every eye closed to do two things. First is gonna to be to raise your hand and make eye contact with me. Once you've done that, you can put your hand down and then just repeat a prayer after me along with everybody else in this place. So if you're here, you say, Sean, I wanna receive Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior with nobody looking around. Would you raise your hand and make eye contact with me? Thanks, 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 thanks. I'm gonna ask everyone in here to say these words after me. Dear Jesus, I'm sorry, I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. Come into my life, and change me, make me new. Be my Lord, be my savior, in Jesus' name, amen. Friends, if you prayed that prayer and you believed it in your heart, scripture says that you are now saved. You begin this beautiful journey away from who you are toward who Jesus wants you to be. And we want the opportunity to walk that with you, to help you become everything that you can be. And so one way that you can help us help you is to take the hello card that we talked about, fill it out, check the box that's highlighted in yellow. It says, I'm choosing to follow Jesus. And either put it in the bucket when it comes around or take it out to the Welcome Center. We just want the chance to pray for you. I'm gonna ask you to close your eyes one more time. Don't leave because we're not done. Pastor Sonny's gonna close us out here in just a second. But if you're here, you say, you know what, Sean, I'm a Jesus guy or I'm a Jesus girl, but I know I'm not really an encourager, not by nature. You don't necessarily have to be the most negative person on earth, but you say, you know what? I could do with a little bit more of an encouraging spirit. If that's you, I wanna pray for you. So if you say, Sean, I wanna be more of an encourager, we just raise your hand, let me pray for you today. So God, for my friends in this place who are acknowledging a need, God, thank you that you are the provider. And so today I pray blessings over them, speak encouragement over them today so that they can speak it over others. In Jesus' name, amen.